Okay, this is the second lesson on OCD and this is on explanations. So I always like to start lessons with just a few um, quotes or something just to get you thinking about it. So first of all, I just want to make it clear that you do need to know a couple of forms of OCD. And just so you know, the two most common ones are excessive hand cleaning and excessive checking for mistakes. So just make sure, first of all, that you are aware that there are different types of and different forms of OCD. OK, so again, there's a, there's a nice quote here that I think sort of explains what it must be like to have OCD. And the idea being that it's like having a soundtrack in your head and the idea of lots of tabs open at once, all saying the same thing. Um, again, there's a couple of quotes here that I like. Um, a lot of people who have OCD report that this is how they actually feel. So this is how they visualise, not in a hallucinatory way, but this is kind of what they're thinking when they're thinking that their hands are dirty. So I don't look at my hands like this. Now, I would imagine that most people don't. But this is, imagine what it would be like. So this is what we're talking about with OCD. Again, there's a clip at the bottom there that you can watch. Um, I have uploaded this i've made a few changes to it so it is on the files if you just go into the psychopathology materials you should be able to access this so the objectives for this lesson are to explore biological explanations of ocd um now please try not to worry too much about the biological content here because a lot of this you're going to pick up when you look at schizophrenia next year so um, a lot will lay down some of the principles now for this, the basis for this. Um, but please don't worry too much about the detail here because you will need more for year two for schizophrenia. But you'll get the idea of the way that we're going to approach this and look at this. OK, so first of all, we're going to talk about the way that we're going to explain OCD. And one way is looking at a biological explanation. Now. You've already looked at the psychological approaches. So a biological explanation is anything that is internal within the person. So that could be brain. It could be genetics. It could be anything physical. So sometimes it's referred to as a physiological explanation. And that's what you might see that in textbook. You might see it in resources. So. The idea here is that all mental disorders are viewed as being like a physical disorder. So, in other words, this is the medical view, the medical model, the way a doctor would view something. So a doctor would always want to look for a part of the body or something physical that was at fault that could be changed. So this is completely different from looking at a psychological explanation of something. This is where we've actually got something tangible that we can see. So you can see I've put a picture on there um, of the brain. And that's the idea being that it's something that you can actually see. And you probably know this, but I'm just clarifying. So a disorder, according to this biological explanation, is either caused by a problem with genetics, which is something to do with inheritance, passed down through genes, biochemistry, which is something to do with some of the chemicals in your body, whether that is neurotransmitters or hormones, or brain functioning. So what I'm going to do now is run through these three biological explanations. Now, you don't necessarily have to know all three, but if you're going for an A, A star, I would make sure that you can know all three. Please ensure that you know a genetic explanation as a basis and can build on it a little bit with biochemical. But again, please don't worry about this if you're not sure, because we can reduce it to basics just to ensure that you get through this little bit. Also, please be aware that I don't know the level of biology that you know, so I am going to keep this quite basic. OK, so we've got three biological explanations and the first is a genetic explanation. Now the way we study genetics in psychology is by looking at concordance rate. 
If you don't know what this is, I suggest that you stop now and go and Google what is meant by a concordance rate. A concordance rate, if I can just explain it, is a similarity rate. It's always expressed as a percentage. So, I'm hoping that you've seen this because you've done the biological explanation, uh, the biological approach, sorry. So we've got here that one explanation is that it is genetic and it runs in families. So there are reasonably high concordance rates for monozygotic twins. So MZ twins, I've shortened it, monozygotic twins are identical twins. I'm sure you're aware of this. There is a 68% concordance rate. So that means that if one twin um, develops OCD, there is a 68% chance that the other twin will also develop it. That clearly suggests some element of genetic inheritance, and that comes from twin studies. Now, it's always quite difficult, I think, for students to write about a genetic explanation, but a genetic explanation is simply, it runs in families and it is explored through twin studies. Why would we look at twin studies? Because they are genetically identical. So identical twins, monozygotic twins, share 100% concordance. So when we look at this and it says 68%, that tells us that there is strong genetic evidence, but it's not completely genetic, or this would be 100%. I've picked this from Shields and Slater, which is in your Green Herd Girls book. Um, there are lots of different pieces of evidence out there for this. AQA will not insist on any particular piece of evidence as long as it's something that is, is, is accurate. Just make sure that you choose one. This is the one that I use. Um, I do have some others in other booklets. It doesn't matter as long as you've got one that you can choose. I'll come back to the genetic explanation in a second. This is just a basic overview um, if you're struggling with biological explanations. Okay. Neurotransmitters. So this is now the biochemical explanation. So this time we're saying there's still a physical explanation, a biological explanation, but this time it's to do with the levels or the production of neurotransmitters in the brain. So a neurotransmitter, as you're aware, is a chemical messenger that sends a signal. And you might have heard of one called serotonin. Serotonin is usually associated with depression, and that's where it's mainly associated with. So, one biological explanation for OCD is it is associated. And notice that word associated. Um, I'll talk to you a bit more about that when I meet you um, properly, but we're not saying causes, so it's quite interesting. Associated with low levels of serotonin. So you could say one biological explanation of OCD is that it is associated with lower levels of serotonin. Now again, I will try to explain this in a little bit more detail. So we're not saying that they don't have enough serotonin. We're saying that there is a low activity of serotonin. Please make sure that you note that down. Everybody has the same level or a similar level of serotonin, but... Some people have more serotonin that is active. So for whatever reason, which for year one psychology, we don't need to know. We will talk about this in year two for schizophrenia. All you need to know is that there are low levels of serotonin. So how could this be treated? For example, an antidepressant drug like Prozac, fluoxetine, which is um, an SSRI. I will talk about that when we talk about treatment. Um, reduce the symptoms of OCD in about half of cases. But I need to make this clear, and I probably should have reworded this, low levels of serotonin is more likely to be an effect, not a cause, because we actually don't know how this fits in. So this is going to be something that's good to evaluate, because we know that serotonin could be implicated and associated with OCD, but we don't know in what way. The final explanation is surrounding brain function. 
and first of all we know brain function is at different parts of the brain and my understanding is is that you've done all the biological elements so you have you will know about different areas of the brain you can see the arrow there is pointing to the frontal lobes and that is where largely on a really basic level our decision making occurs so a really basic explanation would be that people who have OCD have abnormal functioning in these frontal lobes and that's because those frontal lobes are largely responsible for our logical thought and decision making so we're not going to go into much detail at this stage but essentially we're saying that there is some problem with the functioning of those lobes also there's another part of the brain being identified the parahippocampal gyrus is associated with OCD um, actually that is the orange little bit there the arrow slipped down a little bit so I apologize for that what I've put there is the basic AO1 or knowledge and understanding for the biological explanation I'm going to build on that now and add a little bit more um, take this in stages as to what you're comfortable with okay so if you go onto your files and you go into the psychopathology um, class resources you will see a document called OCD information and that is in there and that's what I'm just taking this from there you can see that there is more detail in here now this is AO1 or knowledge and understanding so the first little bit about concordance rates is what I have already um, discussed can I just draw your attention please to the concordance rate where it says there is a 53 to 87% chance, so concordance. Notice there's quite a big gap there, and that's because a lot of studies find a lot of different things. So you are going to find, depending on where you read, different figures on that. It's over 50%. That's something that's quite important. Um, some studies have found it up to 87%. Okay as I got it twins I tend to not look at because they're not genetically identical anyway so I'm being honest I probably wouldn't look at that okay in case you're um, studying biology and you're quite confident with this there is some extra material here that you can use so there are some candidate genes which have been identified if you want to look at these they are in your green herd girl book sorry that's what I call it um, there's the COMT gene and the SERT gene and again the idea being that they've tried to isolate certain genes to see if they are associated with OCD but I think the bottom paragraph is the most important OCD is polygenic and that means we cannot isolate one gene but several are involved so even if we talk about the COMT gene and the SERT gene we couldn't say that in everybody that's the gene so it's probably better to quote Taylor there at the bottom saying there could be up to 230 potential genes the key word there that you want is polygenic okay this is now talking about serotonin again just a little bit more detail on that in case you don't know much about it um, but serotonin is um, uh, a neurotransmitter that is responsible largely for our mood and um, also behavior sleep memory appetite again have a look at the bit where it says it is important in OCD but we don't fully understand it um, so we know it has a role but we're not completely sure and again that would form a lot of your AO3 evaluation finally I've added a little bit on here a bit more detail if you are interested in talking about the brain and you're confident with talking about it I've added a little bit more and there is another part of the brain the orbital frontal cortex which is another area that if function is, if functioning is impaired it may increase those compulsive behaviors okay so that is the knowledge and understanding it is not possible for AQA to require any more than that. The maximum question that you would be asked for AO1 knowledge and understanding would be six marks. We've got plenty there for six marks. 
So we're going to now move on to some evaluation, some evidence. So, first of all, there is a wide range of evidence that this is genetic. So that's quite a generic statement, I know, but it's just to get you thinking that, yes, we have got evidence for this. So, if you know, if you walk up to somebody in McDonald's tomorrow and they say, what, does, what causes OCD? You can say, well, I know for a fact that there is a genetic component. I know that's unlikely, but there you go. Okay, that generally comes from twin studies. Um, and here we go, this is the study that I've quoted, 68% of identical twins shared OCD, as opposed to 31% of non-identical twins. And the general rule of thumb here is you just choose a study and go with that. Don't worry which one you choose. And this is the way that I get students to evaluate what does this suggest. Well, once you've got the study, you can run with it. You can take it for a walk, as we would say. As 68% share OCD, this clearly suggests a strong genetic component, therefore strengthening the biological explanation of OCD. However, as it's not 100%, it must suggest other factors are involved. And then you've got a nice evaluation point there from that. Okay, so, however, a problem is that psychologists haven't always been successful in pinning down all the genes involved. We know this because it's polygenic. Taylor said there were up to 230 genes potentially involved. And therefore, it's very difficult for us to draw conclusions about genetics. Again, we know there's probably a genetic component, but we can't pinpoint exactly what it is. Again, this could weaken the explanation slightly. Right, so I've tended to focus here, for the evaluation, just for the purposes of this lesson, on genetic explanations and how I would go about evaluating something. So first of all, the first thing I would want you to say is, a good strength is there is evidence to support from twin studies. Make sure you can pinpoint a twin study. Make sure you know why it supports. But there are lots of problems with the use of twin studies. See if you can think of what any of those problems might be. Just to give you a clue as to how you could do this, think about how many twins there are, how many twins there are who have OCD, how difficult it would be to get them, how many different ways there are of calculating concordance. So there are lots of twin problems with the use of twin studies. We end up with small samples. Have a look in the notes that I've sent you and most of the evaluation should be there for you. Another problem, the genetic explanations aren't completely clear. They don't identify one gene, they're polygenic. That's obviously a problem because it means we can't really identify a particular gene. Again, making it difficult to draw clear conclusions scientifically. And there are lots of different types of OCD. What I mean is, is that somebody who has OCD for hand washing might be completely different to somebody who has um, an OCD for, say, praying. They are completely different and the, the way that they manifest themselves are completely different. That makes it difficult because it means that if there are different types of OCD, they might be caused by different things and therefore a biological explanation might not fully explain every type of OCD. And finally, I don't know whether you want to use this as a strength or a weakness, but I think reductionism is actually a strength. So, please can you look up and make sure that you have a good definition of reductionism. So, reductionism is when we take something really complex and we reduce it down to basic components to make it easier to study. And this is a good example of trying to study OCD in quite an objective and scientific way. So, we could say that this is actually good. However, most people and most students will argue that a genetic explanation of OCD being reductionist is a weakness. And this is because it only looks at the biological aspects. It 
fails to consider things such as upbringing, um, behaviourism. It fails to consider um, the role of learning in any way at all. It fails to consider childhood experience, thought processes. So that limits the explanation because it doesn't give us a complete one. When you're looking, when you're looking at year two at issues and debates, you will be looking at reductionism versus holism. So therefore, we could say that a problem with this explanation is it's reductionist because it does not offer a holistic explanation. OK, so there is some evidence to support the role of neural mechanisms in OCD. Um, please have a look at this again. This is to do with serotonin. And um, there is some research to suggest that serotonin is involved. Um, but again, if we've got drugs that are effective in reducing OCD symptoms, this clearly suggests that serotonin is involved. But we don't know how. We don't know in what way. So in other words, are the low serotonin, is the low serotonin a cause or an effect? OK, here are two exam questions that you might want to work on following this. Number one, explain the biological explanation of OCD. To access the top band with, a with AQA, it must be accurate and detailed. It doesn't mean you have to quote everything out of a textbook. You're selective. You just have to get it accurate with key terminology. That's what the examiners are looking for in the top band. Next, explain two limitations of the biological explanation of OCD. I've given you several. Please explain them using the Peel system. Make your point. Fully explain it. Evidence it and then link it back. Therefore, this weakens the biological explanation or therefore this strengthens. I hope this session on explanations of OCD have, has helped. Uh, the next session that I upload will be on treating this. Um, thank you for watching.